Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Valley Simsbury today. And today we want to extend a special welcome to all of our fathers, our father figures, grandfathers, uncles, big brothers, spiritual fathers. We honor you today. And we thank you for the impact you have on our lives and on our church family. And what a better way to honor our earthly fathers today than to be together as a family of God worshiping our heavenly father, Yahweh. Would you stand with us? Come bless the Lord with me. For the Lord is like a father to his children, compassionate and merciful, filled with endless love. He forgives our sins and heals the sickness inside us. He surrounds us with love and mercy and fills our lives with good things. Let's worship God, our Father, together. you remember this one, please sing it out with us. Lord, you are greatly to be praised, and your faithfulness surrounds you.
Thank you, Father, for Jesus and your plan to save us. You are so good, and we love you because you first loved us. Good morning, Valley Simsbury. How are you? Good. So for those of you who don't know, this is my assistant, Owen. He is also a representation of our uh, multi-generational church here. Um, and I am so excited to be able to share with you a little bit about kids' ministry. But first, I want to say happy Father's Day to all the dads. Let's get a round of applause for the dads here. 
it is such a blessing that we get to have those physical representations of fathers here and what they're doing, along with being able to worship our Heavenly Father. Amen? All right, so in our kids' ministry, what we're doing, if y'all want to have a seat, you can have a seat, I see. So um, what we're doing in kids' ministry is pretty exciting. We are jumping back into me teaching, um, setting expectations for the kids, and really establishing a nice foundational learning. So I'm going to invite up Miss Indy Cardwell. So if we could give her a nice big round of applause, that would be awesome. Indy is an absolute superstar, and she is going to share a little bit about what we do. So, Indy, what is our roadmap to find scripture? First is the book, then the chapter, and then the verse. All right, that's awesome. Let's give her a round of applause. So what's an example of that? What's, what's a piece of scripture? Like, what's our, our rule? It's quick to listen. Right, and that's what verse? James 1.19. All right, let's give her a round of applause. Now, Indy is one of the first to say that in class, and she's super excited about it. So let's just give her a little extra love, because this is nerve-wracking being up here. So we are practicing those foundational pieces in our class of how to find scripture. And that's very important. The kids are getting hands-on with their Bibles. They're learning, and they're really digging into scripture. Now, because it's Father's Day, I wanted to ask Indy, what is something that your dad does at home with you that you really love? She, he's actually having me memorize some five important verses in the Bible over summer. Nice. And what's one of those? Um, I forget what verse it is, but it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Nice. And that is wonderful. So let's give a huge hand for Dana Cardwell, who's really being a wonderful example of what a godly father looks like. So let's give him a round of applause, too. All right, girlfriend. And then what is your favorite? So this is what Indy told me before. The first response is always games, right? Like, what do you look forward to about Sunday school? Games, right? Um, Also, we have started implementing giving Starburst for bringing Bibles. So that is also another number one. Um, But Indy shared with me a lesson. And what was that lesson? It was the one about what Jesus did to pretty much erase the sin in this world. And what did we use? Salt and pepper. (laughs) And what was the salt? The salt represented what? God's intention for us. And it was what? Um, Perfect. And what was the pepper? Sin. All right. And when the pepper was taken away, did it disappear entirely? Not exactly. Okay. So the pepper left little what? Um, Holes. (laughs) So the pepper left little pepper-sized holes. So it showed that to God, we're perfect. But there's still, if we have sin, if we act on sin in our lives, it's still going to leave those little pepper-sized holes. So to us here, it matters, right, when we invite sin into our life. But in believing in Jesus, we are perfect in God's eyes. So let's give Indy a round of applause. Thank you so much, Indy, for coming up. This one is for the fathers and all the father figures, stepfathers, grandfathers, godfathers. Whether by blood or by choice, we give voice to our gratitude for the fathers, the heroes, the mentors and anchors, the coaches and counselors, teachers and trainers, the men who shape us and show us the definition of faithful and strong and wise, the fathers, always by our side, 
with us and for us, steady and courageous, ready to inspire and encourage and give us a word of wisdom, a voice of reason in season and out. There is no doubt where their strength comes from, what their hope is set on, who their eyes are fixed on, the fathers, the embodiment of legacy, humility, integrity, needed and necessary, dependable and trustworthy. The fathers, the men who lead and love and believe in us even when we don't. The fathers, the men who nurture and point us toward purpose, almost bigger than life, but always down to earth. The fathers, the men who give guidance, direction, and keep everything in perspective, making room for us to grow. We may never know the prayers, the tears, the sacrifices that fathers make on our behalf, yet still find time to play and laugh and rejoice in the day that the Lord has made. The fathers, the heroes, we honor you today. All right, well, hey, we're going to have kids go to kids' classes now, but before you do that, kids, stand up, give your dads, if you have a dad in the place, a big bear hug and say, I love you, and if you don't, uh, if the dad's not in the place today, just give one of the men around you a fist pump and say thanks for being, uh, being with us today. Harper's got to find some, some man over there as she's, uh, as she's taken off, but uh, kids can go to kids' classes and I just think it's awesome what Jilly and the team are doing uh, to, in fact, Harper, you know, she came home, she's, she's going through the books of the Bible. She's memorizing the books of the Bible, and she's, uh, she, she's, she's working on that. She's like, can I come up front and share that? So she, she wants to share, she wants to read scripture and do stuff all the time. So I think she might be up here in the next two weeks. But uh, we love kids in our services. We want kids in our services for part of the time. And then we send them out to some of the teaching. But we also believe that the teaching, the things of God, should not just be happening here at the church, but they should be happening at home. Actually, God's design is that they would start in the home. And so I brought up a couple of dads here that I think these guys are tremendous uh, dads. This is uh, Dave uh, Mench and Ben Woodhouse. And we've gotten to know each other through the years some, uh, probably before the time that that. Uh, I'm trying to think if, if it was before uh, you had John, but, but at least that you guys are in the early stages of parenting, and there are t- tremendous things that are happening right now with uh, a number of the families that have preschool kids. You guys are in a group together, and Dave, just tell us a little bit about the group that you're part of, what you guys are doing, and how, how uh, as dads and as families, you're, you're seeking to influence the lives of the kids. Yeah, um, so Ben primarily leads this group that uh, is um, families of kind of preschoolers, I'd say. Um, so we have about, on average, like maybe five families that join us each week, and it's, it's structured differently than most groups that I've been a part of um, in the past, where one week, uh, so there's a three, it's on a three-week schedule where one week we'll do all dads meet together, the next week is with moms, and then the final week will be with um, all the families together and it's kind of more of just like a community and fun time together just bonding Um, and we're currently going through a book called habits of the household where each week there's kind of a new chapter that we discuss as families Um, the first week was spiritual habits so when you wake up in the morning um, our soul is kind of looking for someone or something to attach to. It made the analogy of when a child is born, um, it's, you know, the child is looking for that gaze from its mother. Um, And so as believers, are we looking to social media or other places for that connection, or are we really looking for God right when we wake up? And so that was like the first habit that we talked about um, and and one that I'm still working on myself. Another one was like screen time. That was this past week that we were learning about. So um, you know, how do we disciple our kids through good um, boundaries, uh, especially this day and age when, when screen time is so prevalent in their lives? Awesome, awesome, good. And um, Ben, just we got to spend some time together actually in a men's group that we were part of for a couple of years. And during that time, I got to know about just your passion 
uh, both to be a dad, but also to impact dads and that they would become the dads that God has created them to be. So just share with us a little bit about your passion and yeah. how you do that. Yeah, so my passion for fatherhood really started, you know, a few years ago when I became a dad. Um, and I guess a passion for present fatherhood, not just physically present fatherhood, while well, that's super important, and I know there's, you know, an issue in society with that today, but emotionally present fatherhood. Uh, and what I mean by that is, like, I feel like that video alluded to a lot of it, but, like, as dads, as, you know, many of you know, like, we're not here just to be, uh, you know, caretakers of our kids. We're not just here to provide and protect our family, although those are, like, super godly habits and amazing, but we're also here to pour into our kids, to lead them, to grow them, to help them know that they're loved by God and loved by us. And uh, yeah, it's just, again, there's, this, there's so many studies, if you look it up online, secular studies of the importance of present fatherhood. Of, again, not just physically, emotionally as well. Um, so as you can tell, I'm super passionate about this because it's clearly so important. It's incredible. Um, but yeah, so I guess how I do it, how I, you know, I guess share this passion um, and try to uh, encourage dads or help dads be the dads that they're called to be is just finding small ways to encourage them. So whether it's my brother-in-law after hanging out with him or if I'm hanging out with a buddy uh, and, their, you know, and their daughter and I see how loving they are to their kid or running into a dad at the Flower Bridge in Simsbury on a walk, calling out that, hey man, like, the way that you're loving on your kid right now is amazing. Like, that is going to have such an impact on them and for their entire life. And not just their lives, but their kids' life and then their kids' life and their kids' life. Like, what you're doing by just loving on them and being present with them, that's going to make an incredible impact in society. So, like, you know, just stuff like that, finding little ways, just running into them and encouraging them. Because fatherhood is so, uh, you know, as again, many as you can, can attest, I mean, I am a father of little, so it's, we're in the thick of the, you know, the thick of it. But also, I'm sure as fathers of older kids, too, like, they're hard parts. So to be able to be encouraged by another person um, and, you know, in that hardship is just so impactful. Like, I've experienced that impact, and I've seen that in others. Um, yeah, so. Awesome. Good. Uh, just, so just final qu question, and we'll just be brief with this, but uh, and we'll start with you, Dave, give you both a chance to share. But I remember someone asking me, I think it was probably six months, a year after Haley was born. Haley's our oldest child. And, and, and this guy, he was a pastor, a friend of mine. And he said, hey, what do you know about fathering? What do you know about God? What do you know about life now that you're a dad that you didn't know beforehand, right? Because you learn things, you know, in this journey. And so just share with us a little bit about what you've learned this past year in the, the journey of fathering. Yes, yeah, great question. Um, I think the biggest thing for me has been um, a dependence on God. So when you're single, um, I guess before marriage, marriage kind of teaches you this too, but um, you, you can kind of rely on yourself a little bit in, in, in sinful ways, kind of depend on your own strength. Um, but when you have a kid or a wife to take care of, um, you can't make decisions for those people. And so you ha really have to kind of pray a lot and, and trust God with different outcomes and, and decisions that you're making in life. So um, we sing a song here, I, I think a lot, um, at least in my mind, it's a lot because I love it. It's Abide, um, mm -hmm. and it talks about, um, you know, depending on God for the sun to rise, depending on God for our sleep at night, things that we don't typically, we just take for granted and we don't realize that they're actually from God. Like tomorrow, the sun rising is because of God. Um, so I think that would probably be the, the primary thing is just, learning that I, I can't be self-dependent, that I need God, and, and for it to be more tangible. Amen. Thanks. Yeah, and I say what I learned, I was just telling my wife about this probably a couple months ago, is I, uh, so I guess with my son, so we have a 10-month-old and a almost three-year-old. If you ever see a three-year-old running around with a fire jacket on that's like torn up like crazy, that's, that's my son. Um, but anyways, so I'll look at him, and I'll be like, buddy, like, do you know how much I love you. Like, I love you more than how many fish are in the ocean, how many stars in the sky. Like, I love you so mm -hmm. much, buddy. Half the time, he'll look at me, he'll be like, yeah. And then the other half the time, he'll be like, I'm not John, I'm a firefighter. And like, you know what I mean? So he'll just totally ignore exactly what I said, even though I'm like so passionate about how much I love him, you know? 
But anyways, to bring it back to the question is like, he will never know how much I love him. Like, never. In a, it's Ephesians, I don't know what verse it is. You know, maybe you guys do. But in Ephesians, you know, the verse about how high, how wide, how deep his love is. You know, we pray that, you know, you know that love, although you will never, never fully understand the love of Christ. And it's like, whoa. Like, I love my boy more than he can ever imagine, but God loves me that way and even more than that because I cannot even imagine the depth and the height of his love. Like that, I feel like that parallel has really been like impactful for me. Amen, amen. Well, may you know the love of God as well. May we get to know that more. And I just uh, honor these guys and honor all the dads in the room that are stepping up and being the dads. So thanks so much, guys. Let's give these guys a big hand. Would you stand with me? Stand with me. We're going to sing another song, and I'll let the, the team introduce that in just a moment. But I just want to say this. Um, Pastor Doug has been amazing in so many ways um, through the years. Um, I, think, I think as a dad, uh, his persistence through the years, but, uh, but also just uh, in the church. And so he's going to preach today, so I'm excited about that. Uh, I wanted to just say thank you, Doug, because... Man, it's a blessing to be able to come to church and get fed and, uh, and just receive today. And also, I was sitting, drinking my coffee, hanging out with my kids this morning rather than uh, getting ready. So I just wanted to say thanks. I'm excited for Doug to preach today. But uh, before he comes, let's just uh, turn our eyes to the Lord again. We're going to sing a new song today, and that's based on the last two verses of the book of Jude. I want to read them to you. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. And you'll hear those words in the song. And as you feel comfortable, it's not that difficult. I've I hope that you'll begin to sing along. But who is able to keep us from stumbling? It's Jesus. Not us in our own strength or in our own goodness, our own effort, our own perseverance, our own striving or our own might or anyone else's striving for us for that matter. It's Jesus. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Let's sing to him. There is a hope for all the suffering A song of joy for all who weep There is an anchor for the stumbling A mighty fortress to the one who is in need Unto him who can keep us, make us blameless in his presence, unto Jesus, unto the only God, and unto him who has shaped us, be all glory, be all majesty, dominion, all authority is yours, right now. Tongue 
Good morning. Let's start our time of uh, teaching this morning by reading from Scripture. It's a short passage. You can go to your Bibles if you like, or you'll see the passage up on the screen. I'll be reading from James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Thank the Lord for his word. Now, Let me ask you a question. What was the size of the family that you grew up in? I had four brothers and two sisters. It was a lot of kids. And getting the attention of my parents? Wow, was that competitive. But the really strange thing about my family was my big brother. He was an overachiever, to say the least. And I think it was more than just the fact that, you know, he was the firstborn, and firstborn, or they're always supposed to be rule keepers and people who do things right and all of that, but he was almost otherworldly in the way he went about things. Now, all of us guys, we learned how to be carpenters in my father's shop. And you know, my big brother, he always seemed to catch on faster than the rest of us. But when he did make a mistake, like maybe hitting his thumb with a hammer, he didn't even swear. But you know, living with my big brother at home 
That was just the half of it. He grew up to be a, a rabbi, even though he didn't have any training. How did a guy from such a small town like Nazareth end up speaking to such big crowds? Now, my family, we were all conscientious about being Jews, and, and, and we wanted to honor the Torah, but my brother kept on saying things that I thought were going to get us in trouble. Do you know that one time he said he was the Lord of the Sabbath? Where did that come from? Now, we tried to talk to him. We said, hey, come on, just come home and be with us for a while. Frankly, we were afraid what he was saying was not only going to get him in trouble, it was going to get us in trouble with the synagogue leaders. Every time he said something weird, which was often, it brought shame on all of my family. Do you know that one time, one time he said that anyone who did the will of God could be his mother or his brother's? Well, how do you suppose that made us feel? Well, over time, I began to think that maybe, maybe there was something to all these things my brother was saying. E even the fact that he was the Messiah. And you know, his death, his death was horrible. My mother, she was so brave to stay there while he was punished. I made myself scarce, along with a lot of other people who were afraid that somehow their association with him would lead to them having the same fate. So we made ourselves scarce. When he finally died, the, these rumors began. Some said that he was raised from the dead. Now, at first, at first it was just a couple of people who saw the, the empty tomb, and I said, eh, maybe not so much of a thing to worry about. But, but then, my brother appeared to John, to his brother James, to Peter and all the other disciples. Soon after that, he appeared to 500 people. Then, then my brother made a personal resurrection appearance to me, to me, his brother James. Well, after that, I believed that he was the Messiah. No longer was he my annoying big brother. He was my Messiah, and I was his servant. So my first job, once I began to believe in him, was to be the pastor of the First Church of Jerusalem. Now this is a hard job because so many church members were being persecuted. And every Sunday when we met, I found out a few other people had to leave town because they were being pers persecuted. But you know, for every one person that had to leave because of persecution, it seemed like there were two or three more who came because there were so many people giving testimony to his resurrection. Now, the one hope that we could hang on to through all this suffering that was going on in Jerusalem was the fact that Jesus has said he would return. And as a leader, I just clung to that hope. Oh, Jesus, come back soon, would you? But he didn't return. And a couple of years later, I got together with some of the other leaders, and we decided 
we better start writing down some of what happened in the life of Jesus. You know that old game telephone, don't you? We didn't want the words and actions of Jesus being misrepresented and misinterpreted by being passed down verbally. So a couple of the guys got working on his biography, but about 10 years after the death of Jesus, I decided I better write a book. You see, the 12 tribes by this point were dispersed all over the place, and they needed a message of encouragement. Besides that, I, I noticed that there were some things going on in the church that just weren't right. Do, do you know that rich people were giving more status and preference over poor people right in one of the churches of Jesus? And then, and then there was the way people were talking. Some of them were just running off at the mouth. Somebody needed to step up and correct those people and remind them that their tongue was a fire that could dis destroy so much. So I sat down and wrote the letter of James. I'm calling this sermon the Proverbs of James because there are so many times in this letter where I just had to say it the way it was. Remember, I had Jesus as my big brother. And if I had survived that, I felt I needed to become direct and to the point when I challenged people in my letter. Well, you've probably guessed it by now. I'm not James. I'm Doug Criscow, just like Mark said. And just to make sure that you're not confused, James was not one of the disciples, okay? There was a disciple named James, but he was John's brother. Completely different family. I was James, the brother or half-brother, if you want to be highly technical, of Jesus. And yes, I grew up as a non-believer until the circumstances took place that I just described to you. But now let's Let's turn our attention to this first four verses of this book of James. This book we're going to study all summer. I'm just kicking it off. So, the first statement that James makes after the introductory verses is immediately like in your face. And that's the tone of this book all the way through. And I, I hope I've been able to describe why that might have been the approach that James took so often. There are over 50 imperatives in James. The, the, the book only has five chapters. But James comes after us with all these challenges because he's convinced that the only real proof of our faith is our actions. So James wants us to act properly and he makes no bones about it. James states some very lofty expectations and the first one that we're going to be talking about today falls right into that category. On the surface, uh, the idea of being joyful in trials, it sounds ridiculous. How could you possibly have joy in trials? James further reminds us in this little four-verse passage that it's not a matter of if we're going to have trials, but when we're going to have trials. Now, I know that if you're a student, you might think, ah, oh, once I get out of this class with that crummy teacher, things will be good. Or if you're employed, oh, once that boss of mine retires, things will be good. Or in your family, oh, once this kid leaves home, I'm good. But you know, I've been through all those 
experiences. And I'm here to tell you, there's still trials. You know, like, I'm retired. I don't have to worry about money. I don't have to worry about time. You know, those things were so critical to me when I was working. Now, I am still working. It's just that I'm not getting paid. That's sort of the <laughs> definition of retirement. My wife right now is reading a book on how to parent your adult children. She's not reading that book because everything's going just fine with our adult kids. And if you are anticipating being an empty nester and thinking, wow, what a difference that's going to make, think again. <laughs> the fact is, we are always going to be facing trials. Look at it this way. The only person who really has all his problems behind him is a school bus driver. <laughs> so, if trials are inevitable, then what should be our response? And my idea in addressing this whole issue is to first examine some of the typical responses we have to trials. Sort of following uh, up the ladder, so to speak, and literally, steps of maturity. So who needs Vanna White when you have Christine? <laughs> She'll be showing you what these responses to trials are. The first one is tears. Now, anybody who's got a four-year-old knows the routine. Something happens to the four-year-old, and they cry. They scream. And the mom or the dad, they go, and they hold them, and they, you know, clean the cut, or they feel the bump in their head, or whatever it is, they take care of it. They sort of bring things down a little bit. But, you know, if that four-year-old advances to the fourth grade, and every time something happens, they burst into tears? That's not, that's not so good. I had one of my 11 grandchildren who had that problem. He was crying as much in the fourth grade as when he was four years old. Now he's a 16-year-old baseball player in his high school, and I am oh so glad then when he strikes out, he doesn't cry anymore. <laughs> now there's another response. And there's all kinds of ages where this shows up, but I'm going to pick on teenagers just for a minute, okay? The response that often happens is anger. Now I take this out of my personal family history as a dad with Christine, the mom, and we had a teenage girl, and she was wonderful most of the time, but sometimes she'd encounter a trial, and she would just lose it. So she'd be screaming and upset, and she'd be in our family room. We'd go in there and say, look, just go up to your room until you can calm down. And you know, I could almost time it. How many seconds it took for her to stomp out of the family room, up the stairs, and bang, slam the door. I was surprised she didn't break it. But that was her reaction to some trials. The fact of the matter is, adults get mad too. But if you get angry in your workplace, what happens? Typically, you're going to find the exit pretty quickly. Because public displays of anger in the context of the workplace, it's just not acceptable. What about when we're behind the wheel of our automobile? Now, it's an easy assumption that, that we are the most competent driver on the road, right? And so when we get cut off, when something happens to us in, in a traffic situation, what do we do? Some of us scream. We call it road rage. And somehow, uh, that's 
receive just a modicum of acceptability in our culture. But it's ridiculous. Believe it or not, you're not the best driver on the road. And that traffic jam didn't come together just to frustrate you. But yet that's our reaction. Our anger is a very inadequate response to trials. Now, the next response that I've observed is complaining. I once worked with a person, and this was in a church, and that individual was a constant complainer. When I went to work every day, you know, like during Monday to Friday, I'd go to my office and anticipate two big challenges. The first challenge was this person because this individual was always complaining. And if you dared to, to complain also, this individual would play the can you top this game because the complaint that this individual had was always more severe than yours. So the best tactic was just listen. The second, cha second challenge happened to be that I was helping to run a church. That was my job. It was supposed to be a challenge. But this individual, I was oh so glad when I read the resignation letter. Now, complaining is certainly common, but it can get worse, our response to trials. We can get depressed. We can just sort of fold inward. We don't want to talk to anybody. We don't want to share our concern. We just isolate ourselves. And you know, at, as a pastor of many years, I've learned that if a regular church attender starts missing for a series of weeks, I'm concerned. It's not that I, I want to judge them or that I want to criticize them. How come you're not in church? It's if they're not there, there's something going on. And a lot of times in staff meetings, we'll talk about what the need or what the trial might be that we could support that person. They don't want to be vulnerable. They don't want to expose themselves. But there's something going on and they isolate themselves in depression. But perhaps worst of all is when depression gets prolonged and it turns into bitterness. Bitterness has the tendency to not only influence us in the area of the trial, but also in other parts of our life. The negativity of our response to the trial sort of spreads out through everything that we are. And there's a verse in Hebrews that refers to a, a root of bitterness. That's the idea that this inappropriate response to a trial ends up making its way through many other areas of our life. So, these are the typical responses that we have to trials. Tears. Anger. Complaining. Depression. Bitterness. I'd like to ask, as you face your trials with those five responses, uh, how's that working out for you? Is that making your trials any more tolerable? Is it providing that encouragement, that sense of we'll get through this, that's absolutely necessary when we encounter trials? No. So, what is the right response to trials? Lo and behold, it's joy. Yeah, it's joy. That statement from James, find joy in your trials doesn't sound nearly as lofty and as inaccessible as when we analyze 
the multiple other ways that we can respond to trials. So as we dig into the idea of responding to joy, to trials with joy, keep in mind that the alternatives are inferior. The alternatives aren't going to provide that solace, that, that support, that encouragement that we need when we're facing trials. Now, give Anna. You're welcome. So, I'm going to put it this way. Take joy in your trial, but you don't have to smile. The confusion that often takes place is that, oh, if it says I'm supposed to be joy and joyful in trial, oh, I should be happy. I, I, I should kind of, you know, put on a false smile and, and, and sort of naively make my way through the circumstances. No, that's not what joy means. We can have joy in our trial, but no, we don't have to smile. But what we do need is a sense that God loves us, that God is sovereign. We don't need the sense that, oh, God always works everything out. Well, there's a verse that says he works all things for good, but you know that's not the sense of positive circumstances that we would wish. It's a much deeper meaning than that. So, as we approach trials with joy, we recognize the sovereignty of God, the fact that he's in control, and the fact that whatever happens, God's aware of it. Not that God's going to fix it necessarily, but God is aware of it. You know, someone has said that adversity is a terrible thing to waste. Trials are adversity, but they are an opportunity. I'm not trying to say this like I'm some self-help guru. This is from Scripture. And Scripture tells us to take joy in, smile, in trials, and I'm just adding the qualifier we don't have to smile. We, we just have to recognize in a positive way that God is in control of our life. And then what happens? Well, endurance is the fruit of meeting trials with joy. Now, the ESV says we'll uh, be uh, steadfast. Well, that might be accurate, but it doesn't like, connect with us very much. We don't use that word. And even endurance, what do I think of endurance? Well, I think of some guy running 26 miles on a marathon. It's not my most pleasant thought. I'm a runner. I did one marathon. That's enough for me. So endurance, it's a good word, but maybe not so motivational. So I'm going to hop over to Hebrews 12, 11. This is another verse about the same subject, about trials but it calls them disciplines and it says no discipline or trial seems pleasant at the time but painful now that's a true statement later on however it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it righteousness and peace now that's motivational to me and i'll talk about it in a moment but i also want to remind you that joy in our trials might help us in our community-focused mission. Community-focused mission? What's that? I hope it has a somewhat familiar ring to those of you who are regular attenders here, because that's one of our five priority statements. And community-focused mission relates to what Mark talked about with last week's sermon about the idea of neighboring, connecting with people where you live, work, and play, bring gospel fluency, you know, all those buzzwords are wrapped up in community-focused mission. Wherever God sends us, that's what mission means in this case, wherever he sends us, we're supposed to represent him. So the question is, will our 
response to trials mean anything to the people who are around us? Now, you're going to hear about this if you're not aware already, but we're doing studies about Simsbury and you know, people who live within 20 minutes drive of here and so forth, and what we're finding out is the majority of them have no interest in God. Now, you probably didn't need research to figure that out if you've tried to express your faith with people you know, but that's the story. So we have an opportunity, actually, if we can find joy in our trials as people who have no interest in God observe us. Again, I'm not suggesting that they're watching you and trying to figure out what you're going to do. It's just not that intense, even though we tend to look at it that way. There was a lady who went to a funeral in Avon several years ago. Now, in her church experience, she had been told that there's no telling what actually happens to a person who died. She went, went to church, she was a regular, but it was another religion, essentially. And she came to this funeral because she knew this person, and you know how that goes, you, you want to be supportive of the family, so she showed up, she was dressed in black, she was expressing, uh, anticipating a very depressing service, but she noticed something about the grieving family. Now, yeah, they were grieving, but, but they were hopeful. They were sure of where their past loved one was at that moment. And she stood up and she took notice. Nobody was coaching her. Nobody was saying, hey, hey, look at that joy. Nobody was doing that. She was sitting there as a casual observer, coming to the funeral of a friend, willing to go to a different church because that's where the friend went to church. And all of a sudden, it began to dawn on her. There's something different about what these, the way these people are grieving. So voluntarily, no one invited her, but she started attending Valley Avon. And not too long a time later, she received Christ as her Savior. No one witnessed to her. No one explained the gospel to her. No one did anything except do what you do if you're a Christian who loses a Christian loved one. We don't call it a funeral. We call it a celebration service, right? Celebration of life because we know that that life continues. I was in grad school uh, long time ago, obviously, and the second day of classes, I had to go to the infirmary. I had had a very exhausting summer, and I was sick. So I was in the infirmary for 10 days. Our semesters, the way they were constructed in that school, were 10 weeks long. So I got out of the infirmary There was limited time left. I had done no schoolwork for the 10 days that I was in the infirmary. And in being released from the infirmary, the medical people said, look, you can go to class, but you've got to get your eight hours of sleep. So I was faced with a pretty daunting proposition. I had to somehow catch up in my studies and still get eight hours of sleep. You know, no all-nighters like so, some students depend on and which I depended on from time to time. Well, you know, I, I wasn't trying to show off. I just knew I had something that had to be done. I trusted that God would be in control and somehow it would work out and I survived the semester. My grades were decent. I was able to move on to the next semester. But one of the guys in my dormitory came to me and said, What's with you? You're sick for almost two weeks. You come out with this incredible academic catch-up that you had to do, and you didn't lose it. You weren't scattered. You weren't desperate. 
Now, I'm not sure that I wasn't some of those things some of the time, but as far as he was watching me, he asked that question. How did you do that? The perfect opportunity in a post-Christian world, somebody asks you a question that you can answer with your faith. And that's exactly what I did. Now, having joy in trials has immense personal benefits, and we're going to conclude with that. But bear in mind that as you go through trials, there just may be people who are watching. You may have heard that statement from C.S. Lewis. God whispers in our pleasure, but he shouts in our pain. That's true for us personally, but he may just shout loudly enough to capture the attention of other people around us who are not God followers, but who are wondering about what's going on with you that you can respond the way you're responding to, getting let go from a job after 30 years, or losing a child due to some horrible situation. These are real situations. We're going to encounter them. It's not if we have trials, it's when we have trials. And when we have trials, if we can seek that standard of joy, recognizing who God is and what his place in our, in our lives, it's going to help us and it's going to say something to people around us, even when we may not realize it. So, what do you really want out of the Christian life? I mean, right now, heaven's a pleasant idea, but none of us you know, are anxious necessarily to get there. Right now, what are you looking for? I'd say... I'd like a harvest of righteousness and peace. You know, I've lived long enough to know that living righteously, it's, it's really a pretty good deal. There are a whole lot less problems by living righteously than by pursuing sin. And secondly, I want to have peace. Now, I'm not suggesting that you're going to have peace you know, as you walk out of the office that you've been in for 30 years and now have been told you no longer need it, in that very moment, I'm sure there's going to be some angst. But in the big picture, as you go home, as you, as you pray about whatever that trial is, as you share it with other Christian people, you get that peace. You get that peace. What a reward for seeking to be joyful in trials. It's almost indescribable. So let me say one more time. Take joy in your trial. You don't have to smile. A watching world will notice when you show trust rather than in turmoil. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this book. Man, it's loaded, and we thank you for that. And Lord, thank you that even, even the trials of life can be managed with righteousness and joy when we trust you. Help us not to think that joy is just too big a goal when it comes to responding to trials, but rather one that is fully accessible when we realize who you are and how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us as we close our time together with this song about having joy in trials and, and praising God in any and every situation. This is my 
See 